Hi, this video is looking at uh, extract from Touching the Void. We're looking at the question two, which is the language question, the GCSE English language. This is looking at the EDUCAS exam board, but the language question is on every exam question. So like I said, it's question two here. So the question is, how does the writer make the extract tense and dramatic? You should comment on what he says and his use of language, tone and structure. So question two, it's worth 10 marks. You should be making six to eight points with the same amount of quotes. You get marks for clear points related to quote, quotes to support points, and terminology for how the writer presents this impression. And what do you need to avoid waffling? So what I mean by this is, for use of one quote, we don't need eight line PE. Just use a quote, explain why it's used, move on. So it's 10 marks, so you should be spending 13 to 15 minutes. How many points or quotes? So like I said, so you should be looking to five to seven. If you could use eight or nine, brilliant, but at least five quotes. And you need to use a range of quotes, like I said, but the example like us to track through the text and have extensive coverage. This means using quotes in the beginning, middle and end. So here's our extract. So we don't just want quotes from the start. You're not going to get that high mark. If we do it all the way through, it shows you tracked all the way through the text and you can talk about the development of the text. So we want you to comment on the effect of words and how they make the reader feel. So the writer has chosen these words for a reason. It might make want the reader to feel scared or happy, excited, whatever. But you need to comment on why the writer has chosen these words and why they deliberately use those words. So let's look at a couple of examples. The sentence could be he awoke to rain tapping onto his window. So if I think of tapping, it sort of suggests that the rain was maybe light, not, not a big a deal, just light little rain. However, instead of we use tapping, if we use the, the word thumping, what does that suggest? Well, if you thump someone, it suggests violence, it suggests almost like a physical fight. So instead of the light rain we just had, we would have this kind of rain, really thumping, really hard rain. Another ex so if you put that into a sentence, we could say the use of the verb thumping makes the storm seem strong and punishing. Let's look at another one. He awoke to a blizzard, okay? So if we change that to, so a blizzard, we get that that image really if we if we change that a little bit to he awoke to a raging howling blizzard well what do we mean what do we think of when we think of the words raging and howling someone's if someone is raging if a person was raging they'd all be like this wouldn't they they'd be really really angry so instead of a light little snowstorm we just thought of it would be something like this a really raging howling angry blizzard so the use of the adjectives raging and howling make the storm seem angry and alive. So that's really in a snapshot what you're doing, but obviously you want to do far better than that in our answer. So these are the things you're going to be looking for in the exam. This is the terminology you need to use. However, you must revise this before the exam and get it right. So for example, if you were talking about the verb um, to run, but say if you called it an adjective by mistake, you would get marked quite down heavily for that. So if you don't know the word, it's better just to say the word. So if you said the word run. However, it is really, really, um, I would advise you to learn these words and use them in your answers. However, you don't need to use it on every point. So if you're doing sort of five to eight points, maybe use it five or six times or 50% of the time. So you don't need to hammer the examiner over the head with it. You just need to use it maybe half the time. So remember the question again is how does the writer make the extra tense and dramatic? And it's important we focus in on the bullet points. The first one is what he says, and his second one is his use of tone and language and structure. So this basically means the first bullet point, what he says, that is the content. What does he say? What does he make to sound make the extra sound tense and dramatic and scary? And the second bullet point, his use of language, tone and structure. This means, well, how does he do it? How does he make it tense? How does he make it scary? And what techniques does the writer use? <clears throat> So you need to look for one or two word phrases, okay? So you don't need massive quotes. You can use a big quote as long as you then analyze one or two word quote as part of that. So I've picked an extract from Touching the Void, which is really interesting. A lot of people quite, kind of like it. I would say there's, there's almost like 30 things you could probably pick in the whole extract. So go through the text. It's really important that you get into the habit of going through a text and being able to highlight seven or eight things really quickly that you can talk about in your exam. So I want you to look at the extract and highlight 10 things. And you're going to zoom in, like I just said, zoom in and pick out one or two word quotes. So here's the extract. Pause the video. I will put this extract on bpcenglish.wordpress.com so you can download it yourselves. But highlight it through and just see, could you highlight 10 things that make it sound tense and dramatic or scary? So for example, um, when he sh says he didn't just hurt his leg, but there was a shattering blow. So we could highlight shattering blow, then talk about it. 
So here's my bullet point. Here's my thing that looks a little bit scary. But it just it just shows straight away that there's loads we can talk about. So the first thing I will talk about, I'm going to zoom in on different parts, different paragraphs. But the first thing I will talk about is that Joe Simpson, who's the writer of the extract, he writes it in the first person. Yeah, so all the way through, if you look at the pink that I, that I did, pink, it's all the way through, it's I, me, my. And th this is really interesting because it's done really because it shows his isolation, it shows he's on his own, but it also shows it's, it's personal, it's to do with him, which is going on now. So it makes it a lot more effective, a lot more dramatic because this is happening to the person too. It's not happening to he or she or the man, it's happening to I, me. We can almost put ourselves in that situation. Okay, so let's zoom in on the paragraph. This is the first one. I hit the slope at the base of the cliff before I saw it coming. I was facing into the slope and both knees locked as I struck it. I felt a shattering blow in my knee, felt bones splitting and screamed. The impact catapulted me over backwards and down the slope of the east face. I slid, head first, on my back. The rushing speed of it confused me. I thought of the drop below but felt nothing. Simon would be ripped off the mountain. He couldn't hold this. I screamed again as I jerked to a sudden violent stop. So let's examine it. Okay, so like I said, it starts with my pink here is my uh, first person. So the first person shows it's personal when it's on its own. But also the first sentence, I hit the slope at the base of the cliff before I saw it coming. So this is quite dramatic, isn't it? Because we begin in the middle of the action. We haven't got a slow build up. We're not meeting the character. It's literally we go straight in with I hit the slope. We're in the middle of the action. So that grabs the attention of the reader. And also straight away, the first verb that is used in the extract is hit. Has connotations with violence and pain and fighting and physical torture. Yeah. So straight away we're using verbs that show we're even going to be in for like a physical um, experience. Then it says I felt a shattering blow, splitting, screamed, catapulted, ripped, screamed, jerked. So all this yellow that I've got in my paragraph here, these are adjectives and verbs. So um, shattering would be an adjective, splitting, screamed, um, verbs. But all of these connote violence, they all emphasize the pain, they're all visual, we can all imagine these happening, and they all show the power and the pain and the aggression that the mountain holds and the pain that Joe's going through. We've also got sibilance there with the splitting and the screamed. Okay, so again, violence, power of catapulted. It didn't just move him, it didn't shake him, it catapulted him like a slingshot, yeah, over the mountain. Then he says, I slid head first on my back, okay? So we could say the commas there create movement, they make the piece a bit quicker. Um, he slid head first on my back, the rushing speed of it confused me. So this shows that Joe's helpless and no control. It also shows with the confuse me that what is happening must be pretty. Um, unique for Joe because he's an experienced climber and if it's confusing him it must be something that is really really bad. Then he's again so he's not just taken off the mountain he's ripped off the mountain a violent verb. He couldn't hold this so short sentence but it's no doubt that Simon would be ripped off the mountain and that's interesting because it basically tells us that it's not just one person in danger now they're both in danger. The audience know it's not just about Joe but someone else is going to die too. Then he says, I screamed again as I jerked again, screams, sort of violence and um, fright, jerked, pain, power, aggression to a violent stop. The adjective violent, again, pain, power. So the first paragraph you could almost sum up by saying it looks at Joe's physical pain, but the second paragraph looks at his mental pain. So again, just to sum up on the I and me, it's written in the first person. It's using I and me. This shows he's how isolated he is and it makes it more personal and dramatic because it's happening to the person. So now it's your turn. So I want you to look for three words or phrases from the second paragraph that make it scary, tense, or dramatic. Again, remember the two bullet points. Content, what does he say to make it dramatic? And then method, how does he say it? What techniques does the writer use? So here's the second paragraph. Everything was still silent. My thoughts raced madly. Then pain flooded down my thigh, a fierce burning fire coming down the inside of my thigh, seeming to ball in my groin, building and building till I cried out at it. And my breathing came in ragged gasps. My leg, ellipsis, my leg. So like I said, the second paragraph looks at Joe's mental pain, his internal pain, in contrast to the first one where it's his physical pain. So it starts with everything was still silent. Okay, that just shows how isolated and alone Joe is. So even though he's broken his leg, if we would have broken our leg maybe um, where you live or at work or whatever, or at school, you'd have crowds of people around you, the ambulance would be called. However, they are totally alone. They've got no one to help them. They're in a vast sort of mountain setting. 
Then he says his, um, his thoughts race madly. Okay, so the adverb there, madly, shows the state of panic he is. He's in. Then it says his pain flooded down. So flooded, interesting verb. So it suggests that it's not just a little bit of pain, but it's extreme pain. All the way through the extract, they use metaphors to do with fire and to do with water and to do with ice. So flooded sounds like it's almost unstoppable. If something floods, it's never going to stop. It keeps going really quick, quickly. That's how the pain feels. Then he says a fierce burning fire. So this contrasts to the water, doesn't it? The fire contrasts to the water. But the main thing about the fire in the water is obviously the fierce burning fire suggests it's raging, that the pain is really horrendous. But both um, water and fire are both uncontrollable and powerful. So that's what Joe is saying. That's how he compares his pain. Then it says the pain builds and builds. So the pain and tension, so it's, uh, the pain is building for Joe, but also the tension for the reader is building. We know there's got to be a climax at some point. Then the verb cried is used just to show how, how pain he is. And then he says he ragged gas, so again, gas, he can barely breathe in so much pain. Then he says my leg, ellipsis, my leg. So the repetition of my leg suggests extreme pain, and so does the explanation point. And also it feels like direct speech. It almost feels like Joe's talking directly to the reader there. It comes out of nowhere. Um, he seems to be fairly, even though he's in pain, he seems to be fairly calm. But eventually my leg, my leg sounds like he's in horrendous pain. Okay, fair paragraph. I hung head down on my back, left leg tangled in the rope above me, and my right leg hanging slackly to one side. I lifted my leg from the snow and stared up across my chest at a grotesque distortion in the right knee, twisting the leg into strained zigzag. I didn't connect it with the pain which burnt my groin. That had nothing to do with my knee. I kicked my left leg free of the rope and swung around until I was hanging against the snow on my chest, feet down. The pain eased. I kicked my left foot onto the slope and stood up. Okay, so um, left leg tangled. Yeah, so the verb there suggests he's helpless, almost like like an insect caught up in a spider's web. He can't get himself out. Then he says his right leg hangs slackly. So the adverb there just shows how severely injured. Like he's really tense. He's really trying to do his best to get out of the situation, but his almost leg is not a part of his body. So his left leg's almost like lazily, left um, right leg's almost lazily hanging there because he can't do anything with it. it. Shows how severely injured he is. Then it says um, he looked at his knee and it was in a grotesque distortion. So the adjective grotesque what is it well, it's hyperbolic it's very emotive it just it almost emphasizes how disgusting it looks distortion means it's not quite how it should be but grotesque means it's like a gargoyle or something it's like a monster that's how his knee looks then it said a twist into a strange zigzag so again we can all very visual we can understand what he means by zigzag it's detailed sort of the adjective strange suggests it's, it's not how it should be then it says at the end is pain eased. So the short sentence used here maybe suggests a bit of a change where he's maybe coming to terms with the pain. Um, we've got a reference with fire where it says it burnt my groin. So again, burnt suggests it's, 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 the pain is hot, it's so sore. Then at the end he says, we see a bit of a change. To kick my left foot in the slope and stood up. So you could see here we, he's a bit more determined. He, before where he thought maybe he was definitely going to die, he's now thinking, well, maybe I've got a chance. Next paragraph, a wave of nausea surged over me. I pressed my face into the snow and the sharp cold seemed to calm me. Something terrible, something dark with dread occurred to me, and as I thought about it, I felt the dark thought break into panic. I've broken my leg, that's it. I'm dead. Everyone said it. If there's just two of you, a broken ankle could turn into a death sentence. If it's broken. If. It doesn't hurt so much, maybe I've just ripped something. Okay, straight away, a wave of nausea surged over me. So a wave, so he's, again, he's comparing it to the, to the water. So the wave, this suggests that he's almost drowning in illness and sick. That's how bad he is. It's like a tidal wave. But then the, the verb surge suggests it's forceful, it's powerful. That's, it's so forceful and powerful, the sickness that he's feeling. Then he says something terrible, something. So the, the repetition of something there repeated is quite ambiguous. It creates suspense. So he doesn't say what, it's just something. It's pretty vague. But it's also ominous and it's a realisation that he really is really something really bad is going to happen then he says dark with dread so sort of dramatic alliteration there um, and it occurred to him I felt the dark thought break into panic so then the connotations of dark what are they so we think when we think of dark we think of pain death nothingness everything that would happen to Joe if he vanished on the on the um, mountain then he says so the thought that they're building up to it says that he's broken his leg that's it Okay, so the that's it, it's a short sentence, it's certain, it's not I think I've broken it, it's telling the reader absolutely sure what's happened. Then, two, two words really that almost scream out in the whole extract, I'm dead, just two words, short sentence, 
almost like a sort of um, an arrow right to the reader of this is what's going to happen to me. So it's a short sentence. Again, it's certain, it's accepted, he's going to die. Everyone said it. So again, he's an experienced climber. So he, he's got the experience that everyone, all the climbers, if he asked anyone, if he took a survey, they would all say, you break your leg with two people, you're going to die. Then the ellipsis here, so there's a few little ellipsis, shows the doom and panic that he's feeling. And then he says it feels like a death sentence. So you, you can maybe say here that a death sentence is something you do if you commit a crime. I think Joe almost feels like he has committed a crime because he feels like he's been silly and he's got himself into this situation. Then he says, maybe I've just ripped something. So even that verb, rip, suggests, even though he thinks he might have not have broken, it's like rip suggests violence and pain. And this is him clinging to hope at the end. Next one, I kicked my right leg against the slope, feeling sure it wasn't broken. My knee exploded. Bone grated and the fireball rushed from groin to knee. I screamed. I looked down at the knee and could see it was broken, yet I tried not to believe what I was seeing. It wasn't just broken, it was ruptured, twisted, crushed, and I could see the kink in the joint and knew what had happened. The impact had driven my lower leg up through the knee joint. Okay, so um, my knee exploded first of all, so really explicit verb, hyperbolic short sentence. It's almost like his knee was almost like a ticking time bomb, something that exploded. Again, the verb grated sounds horrible, sounds like almost makes us cringe when we think of that. Then it says the fireball, again, with the, the image of fire all the way through. It's another fire reference, massive pain. But if you think about a fireball, it's something sort of like almost like gathers speed. It, it catches everything in its path, it's unstoppable. The verb screamed again, it's pain, it's explicit. Then we've got ruptured, twist and crushed. So the triplet of adjectives adds impact and just one adjective adds impact and shows the pain, shows how severe the injuries are. And maybe the worst verb there is crushed, it's almost like a tin can, that's how what happened to Joe's knee. Then it said the impact had driven my lower leg up through the, for the knee joint. So it's, it's, it's factual, it's almost no feelings there, it almost shows exhaustion, he hasn't got time for feelings, but it's a really explicit image. It puts the reader in Joe's position, we can imagine how that would feel and we don't really um, like the idea. Last paragraph, I dug my axes into the snow and pounded my Google Air deeply into the soft slope until I felt it, was, it wouldn't slip. The effort brought back the nausea and felt my head spin giddily to the point of fainting. I moved and a searing spasm of pain cleared away the faintness. I could see the summer at Sierra North away to the west. I was not far below it. The sight drove home how desperately things had changed. We were above 19,000 feet, still on the ridge and very much alone. I looked south at the small rise I'd hoped to scale quickly and it seemed to grow every second that I'd stared. I would never get over it. Simon would not be able to get me up. He would leave me. He had no choice. I held my breath thinking about it. Left here, alone. For an age I felt overwhelmed with the notion of being left. I felt like screaming and I felt like swearing but stayed silent. If I said a word I would panic. I could feel myself teetering on the edge of it. Okay, so straight away, um, the verb dug tells us that even though he's, he's think, we feel like he's given up, he is still trying hard. The verb dug suggests he's working hard. Then it said, um, my felt spin giddily. So the adverb here shows his state of panic, that he's almost faint. Then it said, um, I moved in a searing spasm. So again, it's fierce. It's linking back to the fire, the pain. Then he says, I was not b far below. So it's quite ironic as he is, he's so near but so far because he's not going to get there. Then the sight drove him more desperately. Yes, again the adverb. Before he would have been happy to be where he was, but now it's desperate. It shows how bad it is. 19,000 feet, so the statistic here is, it shows how isolated he is. The reader was worried. I would never get over it, so he's accepting defeat. He would leave me. So a short sentence shows the certainty and panic that he knows he's going to be left. And then here we've got loads of short sentences to show his panic. And also this part of the paragraph, the last four lines of the extract, here we get an insight into his feelings and emotions. So he says, left here alone. So two, two rhetorical questions in a row shows his panic, his confusion. And this is almost becoming the only thing he's thinking about. So the, the fear of being left alone has actually become bigger than the fear of pain in his leg. Then he says, I felt like screaming, I felt I would stay silent. So all of this is he's trying to contain his emotions. Then he says, I was teetering on the edge. So he means teetering on the edge of panic, but we also think as readers he means teetering on the edge physically of the mountain. So we're now going to analyse these words and phrases and explain their effect. So the first quote we're going to look at is shattering blow in my knee, and we're going to zoom in on the word, on the verb shattering. So when I think of shattering, this is what I think of. Yeah, shattering power yeah so we're going to look at the connotations so connotations are the images or ideas associated with a word or phrase so i would say the words i or images i would link with shatter would be shock pieces violence break pain 
crush. So remember, the re writer could have put hurt his knee, injured his knee, broken his knee, but he's used shatter for a reason. It's because he wants the reader to think of this, the violence, the pain, the crushing. So let's look at my knee exploded. So again, a verb. So this is what I think of when I think of explode. So again, think to yourself, what connotations come? Pause the video. So exploded, what connotations does it have? And why has the writer chosen to use this? What word is it? It's a verb. Okay. So again, what connotations do we have? So his knee wasn't just injured. His knee didn't just hurt. His knee exploded. So the writer wants us to think that the knee is a powerful pain. It's violent. It's dangerous. And he wants us to think how severe the pain is. So again, the question is, how does the writer make the extract tense and dramatic? And we said before, we've got to say what the writer does and then how he does this, what techniques he uses. So let's look at a sample paragraph. The writer uses the powerful verb shattering to describe the force of the injury. Shattering suggests Joe felt excruciating pain and his knee was violently crushed. Okay, I want you to see if you can break the paragraph into four parts. So for example, the quote would be one part. See what other parts you can come up with. Okay, so let's look at it again, pick out the four parts. So first one is referring back to the question. So the writer uses, is good to use as a sentence starter, and I'm then saying my point. So I'm, I'm saying the writer uses blah, blah, blah to describe the force of the injury. Number two is my technique. In this case, it's a verb. If, if I'm really on it, I can, uh, if I want to instruct myself, let's use an adjective to describe it. So I'm saying a verb is the technique has been used, and I'm saying it's a powerful verb. Then I've got my quote, which is shattering. Notice how it's a short quote, one or two word quotes, please. Then my last part, my fourth part, is my explanation. So why, I'm focusing on the meaning and connotation, why has that writer used the word shattering? What effect does it give to the reader? And there it all is as one. Okay, let's look at another one. The writer uses the rule of three, ruptured, twisted, and crushed, to describe the state of Joe's knee. The use of three adjectives instead of one emphasizes the severity of the injury and the extreme pain Joe is suffering. Okay, again, try to pick out the four parts that we just looked at. Okay, so the writer uses to describe the state of Joe's knee. That's my point. My quote is ruptured, twisted, and crushed. My technique is rule of three, and my explanation of why that's been used is to say that one adjective is more. Um, emphasizes the injury more than three and it tells the reader the pain Joe's suffering. So how are we going to use the structure? So we're going to use the structure we just use, which is basically the writer uses, so make your point, then the technique, which is verb, in this case, then the quote, in this case shattering, and then explain why that word's been used. So why has shattering been used? What effect does the writer want? Well it suggests Joe felt excruciating pain and the knee was crushed. That's what shattering says to me. And there it all is as one. Okay, there's a sheet I'll put on bpc.wordpress.com to help you to structure the paragraph if you're struggling. And then also, if I was in a class now with my uh, students, I would go through what we've just done in the video, and then I would give them this sheet so they can practice doing the paragraph. So sometimes I put in a technique, other times I put in the quote, and other times I'll just get them to do it themselves. So this sheet I put on the bbc.wordpress.com as well. Okay, so let's look at a few of the quotes that we could have put. So first quote I'm looking at is hit a slope. Remember, I'm trying to go through my orders in order. So I'm starting at the top, start, and I'm working all the way through. This is the first quote. I hit a slope. Joe Simpson makes the extract tense and exciting straight away with I hit a slope. This puts the reader in the middle of the action, and the first person narrative grabs the attention. So my point is he makes it straight away. The technique is... Maybe I haven't got a technique on this one. I'm just saying they use the sentence. Remember, each time I don't have to say verb, adjective. All I'm saying is the, the technique is they've started it right away. And my explanation, it puts a reader right in the middle of the action. Ripped and violent stop. The verb ripped and adjective violent all betray the power and strength of the mountain. The reader knows Joe is powerless to combat it. So, technique is verb, quote ripped and violent, and then I'll explain why those have been used. He couldn't hold this. The writer is also dramatic as we know Simon's life is in peril too. He couldn't hold this. The short sentence suggests the writer is no doubt they will both die and the reader is now worried about two people, not just one anymore. Still and silent. The adjective still silent emphasises Joe's isolation and the reader knows there will be no external help. So again, technique is adjective, then my quote and I'm saying why those quotes have been used. Pain flooded down, focusing on flooded. The writer uses a metaphor, pain flooded down, to show how extreme the pain is. Flooded and fierce burning fire are used as comparison to the pain. 
both fire and water are uncontrollable and powerful. So this is just looking at the annotations. All I'm doing is really looking at my annotations and explaining. My leg, my leg. The writer uses repetition and exclamation, my leg, my leg, to so suggest the pain he is feeling. Both of these suggest Joe is screaming and he can only focus on the pain now. Tangled. The verb tangle suggests Joe is helpless and will not be able to get out of the situation. Really simple one. Grotesque. Okay, so why is the word, when you were talking about his grotesque knee, why is grotesque being used? So again, blue is my technique, pink is my quote, and then red is my explaining. Yeah. So the adjective grotesque is used to describe how Joe's knee looks. This is hyperbolic and emotive and suggests to the reader that it looks disgusting. The reader feels sympathy for Joe, however, they admire him as he seems determined to stay alive. I kicked my left foot, stood up. Remember, we've got to talk about the reader as well, what effect it has on the reader. Wave of nausea that sword surged over me. The water image is again used when Joe describes suddenly feeling ill as a wave of nausea that surged over me. This suggests he is almost drowning in sickness and suffering, while the verb surge suggests it came quickly and forcefully. Zooming in on the word surged. I'm dead. The writer uses a short sentence, I'm dead, to show Joe's mental state. It suggests that this is a fact and Joe has accepted he will die. He calls this a dark thought, with the dark suggesting Joe is thinking of the darkness and nothingness he would become on the mountain. When Joe says the broken leg is a death sentence, this suggests Joe has committed a crime and we feel Joe and Blade himself for the situation. Teetering. Last one. The extra ends with Joe saying he's teetering on the edge of panic. However, this verb also suggests that Joe's balancing act with panic, his sanity, and literally the edge of the mountain face. As Joe is very much alone, the reader feels tense and wonders how Joe will get back to the base camp. And then they all are together. Remember, you'd only need five or six of these, but I just wanted to show you lots more. And to be honest, I could have done probably about 10 or 15 more. But really important, I said at the start, no waffling. So we don't want one quote and then seven lines. You do a quote, say the technique's been used, say what effect it has on the reader and why the writer has decided to use it, what technique. Okay. So all of these, like I said, you don't have to do five or six of these. But if you look at these, these are the quotes. Yeah, so I'm using loads of quotes. Sometimes I'm using a couple of quotes in each one. So I really want to show the examiner I'm using. I'm tracking through the text. I'm using lots and lots of quotes. Okay, here's my 10 out of 10 or my grade 9 answer. I'll put that on WordPress if you want to download it. So it's bpc.wordpress.com. Okay, band explanation. So remember we talked about shattering sounding like something was being crushed. We said a surge sounds powerful. We said that... Um, um, just trying to think of another quote. We said that fireball makes it sound like the pain is growing and killing everything in its path. Those are the real explanations. That is what we want when you focus in on the quote. What we don't want are things like it makes the reader want to read on. It puts an image in the reader's mind. It makes it interesting to read. Saying something like um, it makes it exciting by saying shattering. This suggests it's really interesting for the reader. You're not going to get anywhere with that always in the explanation is you're focusing on that word and say why that word has been used and what effect it has because these statements could be used about any text so in summary then focus on what happens and how the language is used to support this start sentence with phrases such as the writer uses use subject term terminology correct not all the time but most of the time explain the effect on the reader use as many examples as you can that's it for the video the language question on touching the void paper 2 hopefully it's been of some use to you